All right, so I didn't, um, I didn't reserve the front table this time for the uh, Flash Talk speakers, but if you are a Flash Talk speaker, we do have a couple chairs open down here in the front. And if, if you're not in the front, what you could do is just kind of, you know the order here, so just kind of get up at the end of the one right before you and just kind of be available so we can keep the pace going. I think we did a, a really nice job staying on schedule uh, a few days ago, and hopefully we'll do the same. So. Um, I'm really excited to then get going on our second uh, Flash Talk session. Um, it's, as I mentioned before, it's really nice to get a chance to see the breadth of what you all are doing and for you to have a chance to share with the rest of us and the rest of the students. So thank you all for, um, for participating if, if you're going to be doing it today. Um, so without, uh, without any further wait, let's get started. So first uh, up, we have Lauren Lucas from uh, UW-Madison. Lauren, are you here? There you are, okay. It's all yours. Okay, great. Um, lower that. <laughs> so hi, I'm Lauren Lucas. Um, I'm a postdoc now in Daniel Amador Noguez's lab and co-advised by Federico Ray. Um, and I'm super excited to tell you a little bit about um, this paper that I published about microbially conjugated bile acids. Um, and okay, a lot of information. I'm gonna go kind of left to right, top to bottom. Um, so what do bile acids do? Um, bile acids are a major component of bile that's stored in the gallbladder and released after a meal. And it aids in lipid and fat absorption from your diet. Um, but bile acids also get absorbed through the intestine and they circulate throughout the body and interact with different hormone receptors and change host physiology. Things such as lipid and glucose metabolism, of course, and bile acid homeostasis, but also things you might not think about like energy expenditure, immune response. I've even read itchiness can be related to bile acid metabolism. Um, and so I'm just gonna briefly cover the um, bile acid pathway. Okay, so Bile acids are made, two primary bile acids are made from cholesterol by host enzymes. These bile acids get conjugated to glycine or taurine, also by the host. And then those conjugated bile acids, just four of them, travel into the intestines and then um, are deconjugated again, as indicated by the loss of this glycine or taurine here. Um, and then they can be further transformed, usually by decorations or modifications to the steroid core. So what we wanted to do was understand which bacteria can transform which bile acids to inform our understanding of the microbial contribution to physiological um, occurrences that we've seen related to bile acids. So we provided pure cultures of gut bacteria, um, individual bile acids, um, cholic acid, quinodeoxycholic acid, and deoxycholic acid, and we looked for secondary transformations. So you can imagine my surprise when we ran our samples on the mass spec and I was finding conjugated bile acids in my system. Um, so what we decided, or, and those were matched to standards, so glycine conjugated bile acids are purchasable and that's how we knew we were there, that they were there. And so what we did was create a new compound list for our MS1 analysis um, of these three free bile acids conjugated to all of the different amino acids, and using their um, predicted precursor or perineon mass, we were able to look for them in our MS1 data, and we did see a ton of them there. And so what we did was um, further, we decided to do fragmentation, PRM on these molecules at the um, predicted masses, and generated spectra. Um, the retention times match between negative mode and positive mode, if that means anything to you. Um, and so here I'm just going to show an example of a spectra that we were able to identify to confirm our metabolite of interest. Um, so this is serine conjugated to cholic acid, um, and here is the bile acid steroid core, and here's a little serine conjugated to it. And so when you fragment these molecules, uh, we lose the hydroxyl groups on the steroid core as well as the amino acid conjugate, and we get peaks at exactly those masses that we expect to see one for the amino acid, one for the ammonium ion is what it's called, and um, one for with the amino acid conjugated as well. And because we know the precursor ion, we um, can confirm that the entire molecule is built from these pieces. And so um, 
our major finding was that bacteria can conjugate both primary and secondary bile acids to glycine as well as 15 other amino acids. Um, and this is super important because um, glycine was thought to only be a host-derived conjugate. So we don't actually fully understand the microbial contribution to the bile acid pool um, in the body. And I will point out that I did use the word uh, novel in my, um, in my paper, not the title. Um, and I didn't use the word dogma shifting, but people have since. And so now I'm confident in saying it's dogma shifting research. Um, and if you want to check out my paper, there's the QR code there. Thanks, and I'll take any questions. All right, thank you. Do we have time for a question or two? What, can you tell us about um, your choice to use positive and negative for this type of molecule? How did you decide? Sure, sure. Um, so like I mentioned, we were mostly looking at primary and secondary um, bile acids. That's what we were interested in. And these have a carboxyl group on the end. And so negative mode um, is how they ionize best. You lose the hydrogen there, and they're all negative ions. But when we wanted to look at the conjugated bile acids, um, they have the, the amino acid there. And so they actually ionize better in positive mode. Um, we did a little test before we went straight to fragmentation to confirm that the retention times weren't um, shifted at all when we went from negative mode to positive mode. Um, and then, what else? There was one other thing I was going to say, but I forgot. Anyway. No worries. <laughs> we have one question here. Um, are there any like biological differences between germ-free and germ-full mice that you could relate this research to? Um, as far as I, well, germ-free mice wouldn't have any, oops, sorry, wouldn't have any of these conjugated bile acids because they're microbially derived. Um, so they've only been found in colonized mice, and these are gut bacteria pure cultures. Oh, I'm just wondering if any of the phenotypes that are observed in germ-free mice mm. could yes, be related this is, to these. This is so new that people don't really know what these conjugate, microbially conjugated bile acids are doing. Um, lots of people are not convinced that they are circulating throughout the body. Um, I've heard the theory that this is a way for bacteria to trap bile acids in the intestines. Um, and I actually think it's a method for nutrient sequestration, where they're conjugating an amino acid and then taking it back again, too. All right. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. we, could, uh, we could title that mass spectrometry method shifts dogmas. Yeah. yeah. All right. <laughs> OK, uh, next speaker is Eric Moran from University of Minnesota. Go for it, Eric. Hello, everyone. My name is Eric Moran. I am a graduate student at the University of Minnesota working in Natalia Trochikova's group. Um, our group focuses on molecular, biomolecular changes that can occur through exposure. Uh, so this is my newest project that I've been working on. We are interested in the biomolecular changes that can occur upon ex smoke exposure. So why are we interested in this? Um, I'm sure you've all heard the adage that if you smoke, you're going to get cancer. And while that's true in some, case, some cases, actually only 10 to, or 11 to 24 percent of smokers will get lung cancer in their lifetime. And um, though 90 percent of cases of lung cancer are attributable to smoking, therefore, we think that there are additional exposomic risk factors at play here. So the exposome, when we're thinking about this, what sort of exposures both externally and internally can we be subjected to? So internal being like your microbiome, your diet, um, and sort of where you live as well can affect that. So to look at this sort of difference, we're going to measure hemoglobin adducts. So the uh, hemoglobin is a great protein to study because it bioaccumulates exposure over time. In addition, it's super abundant, really easy to obtain, and pretty easy to process. So for our experiments, what we're going to do is have blood obtained from smokers from a large multi-ethnic cohort. Um, and then I will isolate the globin, perform a triptych digestion, and spike it with a uh, deuterium-labeled synthetic 11-mer internal standard. So this internal standard contains an internal lysine, which serves two function. Um, and it's deuterium labeled. So this will serve two functions, both as a control for our triptych digestion, so observing this 11-mer converting to 7-mer, 
In addition, the deuterium will give us an internal standard to quantitate against. So then once we have that digest mixture with the internal standard, we can perform a targeted method to look at actual exposure levels. Um, so in targeting the entire exposome, it's a little bit difficult to look at everything that's there. So our plan is to use an untargeted DDA, DDA method using a high resolution Orbi trap and comparing the blood between smokers and non-smokers to see if we can find adducts that are um, differential between the two populations. In addition, we'd like to find some adducts that are common between them to do this kind of comparison. So we're still at work on that making a list, but as a preliminary proof of concept, I've looked at several adducts which are well known in smoke um, so these form from acrylamide, ethylene oxide, or uh, different metabolites of butadiene. And I was able to observe a slight increase in the adducts in smokers as compared to non-smokers. Though you'll see here the differences are not significant, but that's likely due to the relatively small sample size that I have. So the future goal for this project then will be to expand our analysis to more adducts of interest and apply it to this very large sample size that we have. So that's going to require developing a really accurate and relatively quick method as well to be able to do this. So thank you for listening. Questions? Uh, the way you plotted that plot on number two, so <clears throat> am I to read that 0.1% of all hemoglobin has an adduct even for non-smokers? Uh, yes, this is correct. So most of these adducts um, will also be observed in non-smokers because they can form from endogenous exposure as well. These are not specific to smoking, but they're known to be elevated in smokers. The, the, does that affect... Um oxygen uptake for normal function for hemoglobin. I'm just wondering how I'm feeling today, you know, versus oh, other well, people. <laughs> I'm not aware that it has a major effect on the actual function of the protein. This is at the end terminus. Um, and this, of course, doesn't consider all the other positions that these addicts can form, but. Okay. Anything else? All right, thank you, Eric. Okay, next we have John Lockhart from the Moffitt Cancer Center. Here's John. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, so I'm John. I'm a postdoc at Moffitt Cancer Center. And today I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the machine learning uh, tools that we've been developing and how we're integrating them with spatial multiomics. Um, our lab is a very traditional molecular biology lab. They don't let us anywhere near mass spectrometers. Uh, what we do is we study the P53 family and how it affects disease progression in multiple different types of cancers. And my work is primarily focused on lung cancer. Um, we develop a lot of different mouse models to study cancer in a physiological context. And quantifying these mouse models is very arduous. Um, we're able to very specifically induce tumors inside of the lungs thanks to genetic engineering um, and adenoviral recombination. Uh, but as you can see up here at the top, um, it's maybe a little hard to appreciate. But there's over 200 tumors in this mouse's lung. Uh, and that's actually pretty low on the scale of tumors that we can get. Uh, analyzing this slide took me about three hours. And then once I was done with this, we had two more slides from this animal to, to analyze. Um, and this is a really good alternative to counting sheep if you need to fall asleep. Um, but after doing this a couple of times, I thought, there's definitely a better way to do this, and we could probably use machine learning to do it. Uh, so I recruited a couple of clinical pathologists to assist me with annotations, and we set out to develop this tool for grading of lung adenocarcinomas with simultaneous segmentation by artificial intelligence, or glass eye for short. Um, as you can see below here, this is an output from Glass Eye. It grades the whole slide like a pathologist does, but it does it in 30 minutes on your desktop computer while you're off doing something else, which your PI will love. Um, <laughs> it can find most of the tumors that a human can. In this case, it found 99.8% of them. Uh, and one of the things that we didn't really appreciate when we started this is because Glass Eye is able to grade things at a pixel level resolution, we're able to uncover a lot of intratumor heterogeneity that tumor, or sorry, that human uh, annotation masks. And this is really to make sure that patients get the best kind of treatment um, that's most appropriate to target what's most aggressive in their tumor, as well as to preserve the sanity of the pathologist. Uh, so as you can see here, uh, we have some manual annotations on the top where each tumor is colored with one color. 
Um, and this is the annotation by Glass AI, which shows you kind of in this tumor, there's large regions of grade three as well as grade four shown in yellow and red respectively. So we've been able to uh, use this to study how the loss of P53 silence or tumor, uh, tumor suppressive activity um, affects the progression of these tumors, as well as we've been able to uncover that there are localized changes in the MAPK signaling pathway that is driven by uh, KRAS mutation that precedes tumor progression. And this has actually just been accepted in precision oncology. Uh, but we're also interested in using this approach to do sort of a discovery-based uh, analysis of what drives this heterogeneity inside of tumors. Um, and while there have been a lot of platforms that have been developed recently for spatial analysis of both RNA and proteins, uh, there are some limitations that we felt were unacceptable. So we've been using laser capture microdissection of uh, paired slides and then moving into sort of a more bulk sort of analysis. Uh, but because we're able to get this really high resolution grading with Bass AI, we're also able to go in and very specifically excise regions of interest. So from these tumors, we can excise regions of the same tumor that have similar or different grades to figure out what's going on there that might be driving localized progression. And we can also compare tumors within or across different mice to figure out if there's sort of a signature associated with progression. Uh, so I have a small excerpt of one of our studies here that we're, I'm showing, and where we're able to take paired proteomics done with tandem mass tagging as well as RNA-seq um, and identify a subset or a signature of progression within these mice. Uh, so you can see up here is just using the proteomic signature as they go from uh, normal through grade four tumors, they have an accumulation of differentially expressed proteins. And when we look at the transcript levels of these proteins, we see a very strong agreement because they're coming from essentially the same cells. Um, and that's kind of shown here as a subset of those 86 proteins in this heat map. We're able to cluster them by their tumor grade as well as some genotypes, which is really interesting because it implies that there's a different trajectory based on the mutations that these mice carry. Um, just as an example, you can see over here on the right, there are normal uh, lung section or regions and then low grade tumors and then medium to high grade tumors here that are starting to separate out by their genotypes. Uh, we're still developing this approach and we're beginning to incorporate things like DNA sequencing as well as spatial metabolomics um, before we move on to clinical samples. But we're really impressed with the results we've been able to generate so far. Um, and with that, I'll take any questions. Okay, questions? Do you see one? Yeah. It is, yeah. So it's based on ResNet 18. Uh, which is a pretty lightweight architecture. Um, and then we've also added in, uh, we built a, a decoder into it as well to get that kind of pixel level resolution. Um, and then also included an atrix convolution layer uh, between the two in order to increase the uh, spatial assimilation at the highest feature level. Yeah. Um, would you be able to use this AI to look at like mammograms or something like that? No. It's very purpose built. So we have tried it on some small sections from like ovarian cancer and things like that. If they share a similar architecture and like uh, carcinomas of various types, it does okay. It does actually really well across models. So we actually have a collaborator at Moffitt that works on naked mole rats and gives them lung cancer and it does really well there. And it also works on humans, um, which have a slightly different grading scale, but the features that we use to assign those grades are sort of conserved between the grading skills we use in the mouse as well. But looking at another sort of Imaging modality would not be applicable, yeah. One last uh, question, if anybody has one. Uh, so, um, okay, go ahead. So for metastasis, it would. Um, it would pick out the cancer cells pretty well. What it would do with the rest of the tissue that's not lung tissue, I don't know. Um, because we're really training it to look specifically within lungs. Um, there is a possibility of taking this as sort of a basic model and then building on top of it in future development that we could use to include a sort of non-specific class to so saying this is not the things we're looking at, so we're going to call that as just stroma, essentially, um, which is something we're exploring in other contexts um, outside of lung adenocarcinoma. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. G. Lindsay Lin. Cool. Um, so hi, everyone. My name is Lindsay, and I'm a postdoc from Jim Wells Lab at UCSF. Um, I guess I graduated from Christina Wu's lab at Harvard um, last year, and I have been working on the development of new um, proximity labeling methods in the Wells Lab since the, I guess, 
for a couple of months. Um, so today I'm going to talk about some preliminary data using a high resolution um, proximity labeling method to identify um, uh, the protease substrates. Um, so as many of you may know, like proteolysis is a major post-translational regulatory process. So researchers, including those from our labs, are very interested in knowing like a full list of the protease substrates. Um, so we have used, for example, like methods like immune uh, precipitation or uh, substrate um, facial display to identify the list. However, those methods all require like relatively stable complex formation during this physical enrichment process. So that's why we want to turn to uh, uh, proximity labeling methods as a new opportunity to capture those transient yet functional uh, interactum for um, uh, pro uh, protease, uh, so current um, proximity labeling methods include enzymatic proximity labeling methods just, such as APEX, BioD, and TurboID. We heard so many, uh, like a couple of talks about those uh, already. Um, but method like there have been uh, recently a new type of methods called uh, microenvironment mapping, where um, people use light to activate uh, photocatalysts such as riboflavin or uh, metal-based uh, catalysts. Uh, to transfer this energy to a uh, bi like photoreactive probe and then generating those highly reactive species such as in this case uh, phenol and this in this case carbene and then um, label the proteins in proximity. So um, those methods have been really robust in terms of finding the direct interactum um, for membrane proteins. So we wonder is it possible to use that to identify uh, protease substrates as well. So in my proof of concept model, what I did was to test this idea on a CASP3. So the first step is to um, introduce an azide uh, handle onto the CASP using bio bioconjugation method. Then I click on this iridium-based catalyst um, and form this uh, CASP3 iridium uh, conjugate. Um, co incubate um, this con conjugate with um, direct elicit and then shine light on it. So the activated iridium will transfer the energy to diazerine nearby and then introduce a biosognal handle, in this case a biotin, onto substrates in proximity. Um, I also included a uh, covalent um, inhibitor to um, uh, block this interaction. So it will serve as a control like interactum or like a background interactum for quantitative um, um, aspect. Uh, so my preliminary results show that the caspase conjugated are still active. And I also did a um, Western blood analysis uh, and I see like enough proteins being biotinylated. And when using those samples for um, aspect, I found 665 proteins at potential um, uh, rich hits. Um, and I basically just um, compared the this, this data set with previous data sets and found uh, reasonable overlap. Uh, but right now I'm still like trying to look at those data sets more closely and uh, try to answer all those questions as like, what are the known and unknown targets in this data set? And also, is it possible to identify some additional regulators in like modified version of this workflow? Uh, so I have some future directions of this project, including like, can we look at other proteases? And I'm also interested in other transient uh, uh, interactions or post-translational modifications or regu regulatory processes. So um, I think there will be a lot of things to do. I want to thank the, uh, the Wells Lab, very amazing lab, and especially Jonathan and Jia, who gave me a lot of like input on this project. Um, I can take any questions. Okay. Go ahead. Maybe just loud. You can. <laughs> uh, the labeling, the photo labeling. I know like the mechanism is fast, but how long do you actually try to hype? Do you like turn it on and on, or do you have to like wait for a long time? That's a very good question. So when Nick asked, was like uh, how basically how's the kinetics and how long do I really need to irradiate samples? So for this experiment, I need five minutes of normal LED light. I don't need even like uh, high intensity light, whatever. And I did this like um, kinetic experiments and people have done that too, just like uh, what is reasonable. And I think like two, three minutes is already enough to um, 
basically we uh, have a hundred micromole concentration of your probe like fully convert. Um, yeah. Anything else? Yeah, so the question was like, having a small molecule inhibitor, I guess, what's the function of the small molecule inhibitor? I see. Mm -hmm. So uh, the question is, I guess, is like the small molecule, whether it's enough to block this interaction at all, and like, would it give like, not an ideal background? So um, that's a very interesting question. So. Um, Right now, what we observed for all those hits, potential hits over there, is a case dependent. So we'll be looking at all those substrates that can compete it off by this covalent inhibitor in specific. So you can imagine like there are mutants of caspase, for example, that are just like inactive or just not able to bind or whatever, and we can definitely do the same workflow on those to expand. Yeah. Anything else? Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, we have Jessica Deutsch next. Here's Jessica. Thank you. So my name is Jessica, and I'm a graduate student in the GARG lab at Georgia Tech. I'm excited today to share with you a part of my research in which we leverage metabolomics to discover ecologically relevant coral-derived bacteria strains. So coral reefs are vital supporters of oceanic biodiversity as they host nearly a quarter of ocean life. Unfortunately, reefs are continually threatened by disease outbreaks such as stony coral tissue loss disease, or SCTLD, which first appeared in Florida reefs in 2014. Since then, SCTLD has spread to Florida and Caribbean reefs with devastating effects. Whole coral colony mortality can occur in a matter of months of the disease's arrival, and within the Florida coral reef system, at least 30% of corals have died due to skittle D. While the causative agent of this disease is unknown, it is hypothesized that bacteria are possible co-infectors, and fortunately, probiotic bacterial treatments have been successful in halting lesion progression. Stony corals partake in a variety of interactions with eukaryotic endosymbiotic algae and prokaryotic microbes. These relationships can be maintained through chemical crosstalk that occurs via metabolites. And the coral probiotic hypothesis states the coral-associated microbiome will be modulated in order to obtain microbes that provide the most competitive advantage to survival, which includes defense against pathogens. Rapid dereplication of metabolites is paramount towards understanding the relationships between coral and their microbiota, and includes identifying metabolites from pathogenic genera, since many of these bacteria are implicated in diseases like Skittle D. Untargeted mass spectrometry coupled to liquid chromatography is one approach for detecting metabolites from coral-derived bacteria that displayed bioactivity against skittledy associated pathogens. The metabolomics data is analyzed using a suite of in silico tools and statistical analyses. We can use hierarchical clustering analysis to visualize the metabolome similarity between strains and identify isolates that produce unique metabolites. Such isolates can be prioritized and tested as treatments for skittledy. We use upset plots, which are analogous to Venn diagrams, to visualize the intersections of multiple sets. This allows us to visualize the metabolite feature distribution and identify isolates that are metabolically diverse. Feature-based molecular networking, which groups metabolite features with MS2 spectral similarity, enables rapid annotation propagation. If a given metabolite feature is known, then we can use the shifts in mass to charge between the MS1 spectra and between fragment peaks in the MS2 spectra to propose additional compound identifications. 
The annotation of Andromed, which was proposed by the in silico tool mole discovery, provided insight into an ecologically relevant Vibriocorolyticus strain. This strain was the most metabolically diverse of the Vibrio isolates in our study, and it was the only strain that displayed bioactivity against a Skittledy associated Lessingeris species. The annotation of Andromed was also biologically relevant as this is a known virulence factor from Pacific-derived Vibriocorolyticus, and the presence of this metabolite in our Atlantic-derived Vibriocorolyticus alerted us to the presence of this metabolite within our reefs. Feature-based molecular networking enabled the annotation of andromed analogs and biosynthetic precursors, which highlights the value of including in silico tools within the workflow of LCMS metabolomics analysis. And so the data acquired on these coral-derived bacteria will continue to serve as a resource to enable insight into the relationships between coral and their microbiota. And as the in silico tools are further developed, we can continue to identify metabolites from these and other coral-derived strains in order to understand chemical-mediated chemical communication in corals. So with that, thank you for your attention and happy to take any questions. I'll just start, um, I guess, is this uh, particular um, disease new to the corals? Because I, I, I understood that corals were under attack, but I thought it was the warming temperature of the ocean, not necessarily disease, or are they related? That's a great, that's a great question. So this is a, a considered a novel disease. Um, it was first observed in 2014. Um, it uh, falls under the umbrella of white plague diseases. And so while they're it's unclear if there is relationships with warming. This is separate. So there's a phenomenon called bleaching where coral lose their algae. Um, and you may have heard of Great Barrier Reef. Bleaching occurs there frequently. Bleaching is also occurring within the Florida Reef and with Caribbean reefs. In addition, we have this disease and other coral diseases. So corals really are quite threatened. Um, it's unfortunate, but we can use our tools to start to understand these diseases and prevent them. And uh, yeah. Other questions? Go ahead. Ah, okay, so that's a great question. So we have a metabolite that was known from a Pacific Vibrio. It's now found in the Atlantic Vibrio. Um, so, and we checked the genome. Yes, this this Atlantic. So this is this is a pathogen. Um, Vibriocorolyticus is considered a, a pathogen. Andromed as a virulence factor will make Vibriocorolyticus more infectious. So it, it becomes a, a question of, well, is this particular strain associated with the disease? That's something that we have to identify. And then if it is associated with the disease, then the conclusion we draw is, well, it, has a it, can, it can make a virulence factor. So give if this is involved then the corals that host Vibrio Coroliticus that can produce andromed, if that association occurs, then we would be more concerned. Um, separately, we do know that Pacific, uh, Pacific corals are susceptible to this disease. The disease hasn't arrived yet, but in aquaria testing has shown that if it transmits um, and arrives at those reefs, they will be susceptible. One more. That's a great question. So we are currently using antibiotic treatments. We apply amoxicillin. Um, the most common way is via a paste that adheres to the coral skeleton and tissue. With probiotic treatments, a variety of methods have been tested, including um, inoculation, settling a bag over, and letting the probiotic stay there. Uh, ideally, if we, if the, the more and more the bacterial component matters, the more and more we'd want to use these treatments. Ideally, what you could do with a probiotic treatment is apply it initially. And so the bacteria would already be colonized, living within the coral. When the disease arrives, then you've already got your treatment there. So almost pre-treating the corals would be the eventual goal. So we just have to find bacterial strains that work for each coral. And yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. OK, Zhang uh, Yang Zhu from uh, Pacific Northwest. Here he is. Yeah. I'll have to move it. Um, press forward. Yeah. That's the laser. 
Okay. So good morning, everyone. I'm Zhang Yangxu. I'm a postdoc at Pacific Northwest National Laboratory. Today, I'm excited to share you some spatial proteomics work that we recently did. So we all know that brain consists of different cell types and structurally formed uh, different regions with distinct biological functions. The beauty of spatial proteomics is to understand biological functions by resolving the protein profiles from the tissue sample without losing spatial information. However, this technique faces a lot of challenges. For example, the precision of sample collection, irreproducibility, throughput, and in some cases, you need special collection devices. Therefore, to address those challenges, our group recently developed an approach called WCSOP, which stands for wide collection and sophisticated assisted wide uh, co collection. So this is a very convenient approach that this figure shows here. Uh, oh. Sorry. Uh, oops. Oh. Okay. So this figure shows you the overall workflow for this SOP approach, which starts from the putting the pen membrane slides on the laser capture micro dissection microscope, which we call it LCM. And the laser will penetrate through the pen membrane slides, and also the tissue will be cut and then catapulted into the buffer that preloaded in the PCR tube cap. And that buffer contains sophisticated and also protease. And we, per, we collect the sample in one cap, one tissue section uh, fashion. And then we will check the, the collection and then close the PCR tube and put in a 75 degree oven for cell lysate and protein extraction. And after that, following the 30, 33 overnight digestion, and then we centrifuge the PCR tube and then insert that in an angelin well for LC injection, followed by mass spec analysis using QEVAC UHF and DIA method. We use this WCSOP approach to resolve the 14 regions of interest across the, the whole mouse brain corona section, which come from the wild type mouse brain. And also we collect each individual tissue voxel from every region, and then this image shows you how the tissue voxel look like. We call it voxel because it's analog to pixel. And then here comes the results. First, we can identify 45,000 peptides across most of the regions, and we can identify 5,000 protein groups across all the regions for every single voxel sample. The CV is typically 15%, which demonstrates the robustness and the reproducibility of our method. And then we start to resolve the data. First, we, we establish the x distance, the y distance for this slice, and we correlate the average distance between uh, the, any of the two regions in terms of the number of significant proteins, we can find that there is a moderate correlation between the distance and the number of significant proteins, which suggests that most of the proteins did not show strong correlation with their spatial distance. However, when analyzing the data, we do find around 20 pr proteins have strong correlation, and we see them here as the example, for example, at top, the protein related to the fatty acid metabolism, the protein abundance decrease, and the protein related to the neural growth regulator increase, and based on the X distance increase, and also based on Y distance increase, the protein related to the cell recognition, and also the calcium dependent protein kinase, the abundance increase. So at last, we want to try to understand the region specific protein signatures and pathways, so we, use a different method to analyze the data. We select the specific region and versus the rest of the 13, and then we generate this figure. We can see that for the HY region, which stands for the hypothalamus region, have the highest significant protein number with around 600, and the lowest less to the FV region, which stands for the four brain bundle area, and we use these significant protein numbers to do the enrichment analysis and merge them all together here. The yellow means no enrichment, and the red and blue means strong and weak enrichment. We can see that horizontally, you can see some of the region only specific enriched the biological pathway. For example, the innate re immune response related to the mucosa only enriched in the racial split area. And this biological pathway is related to the emission and autonomous disease. And also some other biological processes are enriched in multiple regions. For example, RNA splicing and neural projection development. We can also see vertically the hypothalamus region and the hippocampus region are enriched uh, a lot of shared biological processes which indicate the similarities between these two regions in terms of the learning and memories. 
So in general, the overall, so our approach can identify 5,000 5, protein groups at 200 by 200 micron with 10 micron thickness, which stands for 100 cells. And also we can find a moderate correlation along the distance and up to 600 region-specific protein signatures. This is just the overview of our work, and I'm stuck here and happy to take your questions. Thank you. Uh, because we can use this method to identify the protein profiles of the tissue sample. And MODI, you can also do the imaging and also, but the target you are limited and for our, for our approach, we can identify a lot of the potential markers for future imaging techniques like MODI and others. So you can get more depth. I yes. Yeah. Uh, how, how much uh, protein mass do you get out of one of these voxels when you do the extraction? Oh, that is a good question. There's a reason we list here 100 cells. Typically, one cell equals to around 100 to 150 picogram. So 100 cells uh, equals to 10 nanogram around that. Okay. Okay. Still pretty small. Yes, small sample, sample <laughs> pressing. Impressive. Other questions? Go ahead. Yes, we, we consider that a system, systematic error because we will use the grid mode and the, after the collection cutting, the, the laser will generate one pulse at the center of the tissue and calculate that. For every voxel, we already we use the same procedure. So all the voxels have this. So we consider that as a systematic error. Thank you. Anything else? Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. All right, next we have uh, Kazuhiro Oki, Medical College of Wisconsin, just about an hour down the road that way. Welcome. Thank you for introduction. I'm Kazuhiro from MCW. So first of all, of all I would like to thank you organizer, especially Dr. Josh Kuhn and his laboratory member, Laura, and then people present lectures. I really enjoyed uh, this summer school this week. I have learned a lot of stuff epitomics, proteomics, glycoproteomics, metabolomics, such and such. So one thing I think, you know, uh, they didn't mention is about a uh, glycolipid. So I'm gonna talk to you a little bit of background and explain why this molecule is important. So uh, this is an uh, image of a uh, cell membrane, which has a uh, lipid bilayer with a phospholipid. And then as we have run, this uh, protein can be glycosylated, and then glycolipid is here. So this is glycosphingo repeat. Uh, this is basically ceramide linked to uh, glycans. So ceramide is uh, synthesized uh, from the serine and uh, polymer coa making sphingoid and adding fatty acid and making ceramide. If this ceramide sent to uh, ER, it's making a uh, glycosylate ceramide. And if sent to a uh, Golgi apparatus, while traveling Golgi compartment, this uh, lipid making complex uh, glycolipid, such as ganglicide or neutral glycolipid. So uh, this GM3 uh, synthetic deficiency is uh, caused by a mutation of st 3 g gene. This enzyme catalyzes uh, uh, transferring this uh, CMP cyanic acid and cyanic acid onto this lactosteramide and making this GM3 ganglicide. The patient usually uh, lacks uh, this enzyme activity and causing uh, disrupting uh, this ganglicide by same pathway, resulting in the complete lack of this ganglicide. So this ganglicide molecule is enriched in the neuron or brain, and if it takes part in important role in the neurological functions. So patient with this GM uh, synthase deficiency is originally identified in the uh, Ohio Amish uh, populations and the causing uh, Amish epilepsy syndrome, termed AES. So my group uh, independently identified mutation of this enzyme which is uh, identified from African-American sibling causing salt and pepper syndrome. These patients exhibit uh, severe neurodegenerative disorders, such as failure to thrive, seizure disorders, and uh, vision loss, uh, loss of hearing. And then, you know, uh, these patients usually you know, survival rate is approximately uh, 20 years old. So what we did was, you know, uh, basically we took uh, skin fibroblast 
differentiate into IPAs and further differentiate into the neural cross cells. And they carried out comprehensive uh, mass spec analysis, targeting uh, profiling glycolipid, uh, protein linked to uh, gly glycans, as well as this uh, nucleotide sugar component. So what you can see here is a TLC chromatogram. And this is a standard molecule, neutral glycolipid on granular side, such and such. And this is a control. As you can see, usually IPS cells express neutral glycolipid. However, after differentiating into neutral cells, it expresses more gangrocyte molecules. So there's two mutations, but this is different location mutation in the S3 gel 5 causing Amish Epilis syndrome or Sultan Pepper syndrome. So if you look at this neutral glycolipid fractions, the profile is very similar to wild type. However, if you look at this uh, acidic glycosamine lipid fraction, specifically it's in this Amish Epilis syndrome uh, patient, you see increase of lactoceramide. Because if enzyme is not inactive, uh, the biosyn pathway is forward to making this lactoceramide. However, this increase of lactoceramide is not observed in the SD3, uh, SP, uh, sodium pepper syndrome. Instead, we see increase of higher, uh, more large size of glycolipid. So we identify this uh, molecule by mass spec, which is basically uh, this uh, LC4 with extended uh, polylactosamine elongations. So this uh, kind of is the difference between these two molecules. So this glycolipid is enriched with the lipid draft and in the lipid draft, so there are a lot of signaling molecules enriched, such as G protein, SAC, uh, protein kinase, or integrin, or such and such. Alteration of these glycolipids are changing these signaling pathways. In fact, we see alteration of phosphorylation of insulin receptor or EGFR or other molecules. And these changes specifically causing cell-specific apoptosis in this cgm synthetic deficiency. So we questioned what kind of cell surface uh, proteins changes by mutation of these genes. So basically, uh, what we applied was since you know, these proteins can be glycosylated, uh, we synthesized uh, butyrated CMP cyric acid and added exogenous cyric uh, cell transferase, which is called ST3, ST6 GAL1, and making this glycoprotein and pull out because this has butyrated. So this is SDS space. As you can see, you can, this molecule is kind of increased compared to wild type. This is kind of uh, reduced. So we carried out in their digestion and they identified and they will see a significant difference of you know, uh, lipid raft associated uh, protein while some molecules are decreased. So these changes may be associated with the uh, uh, pathophysiology of this DM3 synthase deficiency. So finally, what I wanna talk is uh, our cancer center is developing a new cancer research building and we are uh, currently recruiting faculty level candidate as well as a postdoc. If you have interest about working at the MCW, please let me know. Thank you. Thank you. Questions? Maybe you could elaborate. I, you're right, we didn't, uh, we didn't have a, a session on uh, glycoanalysis. Uh, maybe something we should think about adding next year. But for, for your analysis, I trust you're using a mass spectrometry. Yes, yeah. under, can you tell us a little bit about your platform and how you use it for these molecules? Um, basically, uh, we use you know, um, huge remorse equipes for proteomics analysis and then other kind of old, uh, old trap type mass spec for glycolipid analysis. Basically, we extract the lipid from cells and then that lipid fraction contains a fossil lipid. We just destroy using alkaline condition and it's glycosin lipid and subject to mass spec analysis or glycolipid profiling. And then we collect a precipitated protein and use that fractions for the proteomics or uh, in glycomics or glycomics or such and such. Okay, yeah. Other questions? Yes, Nick. Um, this method is a pretty established method a uh, long time ago. We usually, usually don't see altered uh, glycosylation while doing sample processing. And maybe I can share my method with you if you are interested in doing such research. I think I saw a hand over here. Yeah, 
So, for example, you know, glycoprotomase, you, know, you, you have uh, such a bionic or glycoflag or such some data notation software you can use for glycosphingolipidomics, you know, uh, there's not such a semi-automated software which support. But, you know, a uh, few years back when I got NIH grant, our group developed uh, automated software which support glycosphingolipid analysis, which is um, posted on my former workplace at CCRC, University of Georgia. If you have interest, I can provide you that website information. All right, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. All right, our last flash talk of the, of the conference, uh, James Vitava, Mortgage Institute, so right upstairs. Um, all right, I'm excited to wrap up the flash talks, talking to you about my story, um, which is primarily just using mass spectrometry, a pretty common method nowadays, um, to try and understand biology. Um, and the biology in question here is neutrophil differentiation. So you differentiate um, billions of neutrophils every single day, and this is because they're cells with incredibly short half-lives. They have circulating half-lives of less than a day. Um, they're an essential part of the innate immune system um, that's kind of been ignored for a while uh, because of their short half-life. Um, and there are now models that have been developed um, to study their differentiation in vitro, um, such as this ER HOXP8 immortalized uh, progenitor cell line. Um, so these are um, progenitor cells that are immortalized just with a HOXP8 oncogene um, expressed off of estradiol receptors. Um, so when I um, remove estrogen from the media, these cells differentiate into neutrophils. Um, and then I use a pretty um, basic workflow of a lipid extraction, I've done this with butanol, methanol, um, and a Foltz extraction, uh, reverse phase chromatography, um, followed by top five uh, tandem mass spectrometry, um, and then using uh, Lipidex lipid identification developed in the Kuhn lab um, with the peak picking done in MZ mine too. Um, and so when I do this, uh, the fourth day of differentiation, uh, you can clearly see that these differentiated almost neutrophils um, compared to the non-differentiated cells, has a very distinct uh, lipidome. Um, and if I do an enrichment analysis on these cells, I find that the most enriched and changed or increased lipid species is sphingomyelin. Um, and as you just heard about ceramide, sphingomyelin is a product of ceramide um, and the choline group from phosphatidylcholine. Um, and so this choline group is transferred to ceramide um, by the enzymes SGMS1 and 2 um, to generate single myelin and diacyclosterol as a side product. Um, and there are small molecule inhibitors to inhibit this process. Um, one of these is line 93. So I was curious, I see this huge enrichment in single myelin. What happens if I stop this process using the small molecule inhibitor? Um, and when I inhibit single myelin synthase 1 and 2 with line 93, um, I can measure cell differentiation um, with these external cell markers, uh, GR1 and CD11B. Um, and I find that when inhibited, single myelin synthesis is inhibited, um, I see decreased cell differentiation or less GR1 expression. Um, and this is indicative of immature neutrophils. Um, and so I can integrate um, data, transcriptomic data sets into this. So there's people that have published transcriptomic data sets um, using these cells. Um, and you can see that this is like this increase in spingle myelin is likely driven by a huge increase in spingle myelin synthase 2. Um, just one day into differentiation, um, whereas single myelin synthase 1 um, is not increased. Um, so I can learn about the biology by integrating these transcriptomic data sets um, to find that um, this increase in spingle myelin is probably driven by spingle myelin synthase 2. Um, and then furthermore, I can take a look at some G human GWAS data sets that have been published recently, and I can find that uh, spingle myelin synthase 2 um, is located in the genetic loci that's significantly associated uh, with human neutrophil counts. And so in the future, I want to, one, investigate how these well-defined cellular signaling molecules in ceramide, uh, sphingomyelin, and diacylglycerol um, can maybe affect the cell differentiation, um, and furthermore, use this idea of integrating transcriptomics and GWAS data sets to identify metabolic genes um, that could affect cell differentiation. Um, and so when I integrate these data sets, um, just looking at metabolism genes, so like transporters, enzymes, uh, kinases, et cetera, um, there are 86 genes that are both upregulated 
at the transcriptomic level in these ER HOXPA cells um, and are located within hemogenetic loci that are significantly associated with neutrophil counts. Um, so the plans for the future are to use this as a guide um, to try and understand how metabolism supports neutrophil differentiation. Uh, and with that, I'll take any questions. Go ahead. Like, you know, you see, um, so like, this is a fairly or? new project, and unfortunately our mass spec has not been operational for two months, so <laughs> I don't know, and that's the most important next question. I also have genetic knockouts of single violence in phase one and two that I'm starting to phenotype. I actually started a differentiation yesterday. Um, uh, so this is very much an ongoing project, and yeah, those are the most important questions. One, I don't actually know if this is on target, um, but I can test that soon once the mass spec is back. Um, and I'll add the genetic knockouts of single violence in base one and two. Other questions? Okay, thank you. All right, so uh, thanks to all the flash talk speakers. Those were great. Uh, you guys did a great job of explaining what you're up to, and it's really nice to see how many different areas of science that. Uh, this technology can impact. Okay, before we break for lunch, I just wanted to sort of set up the rest of the school. So you'll notice on the program, when we come back from lunch, we had, as a, it says on the program, technology forum, something like this. Uh, the intention of that time is to basically give you all a chance to ask the questions that um, maybe have come up or that you've seen this talk and you've seen that and you've thought about your own research over the last few days and you, you have some question about, uh, you know, where do you think this is gonna go? Or, or it could be very specific too about your own research, but, uh, but it could also be as broad as, hey, I've, I've um, read about uh, technologies for protein analysis that don't involve mass spectrometry. What do you guys think about that? Like, is that gonna happen? Is that good? And what I'd like to do is ask all of the instructors uh, who, are, who are still here to um, sit toward the front after lunch. And we're gonna, and I'm gonna try to moderate your thoughts and questions and put them, well, sorry, put them to the, to, the, uh, to the instructors, but also would love to have you all chime in as well. So I, I think we can have a pretty nice discussion. So uh, this doesn't work though if you all don't have uh, pressing questions or interests, but I know you're a very engaged crowd and you've heard a lot of stimulating talks this week. So what I'd like to, you to do over lunch is to discuss amongst yourselves, you know, what are things that you're really curious about after hearing all these talks? Formulate some questions, come back, and then let's put the panel to work on, on, on those questions. And they, we may not know the answers, but you can get opinions and thoughts, and, and, and it could range as broad as you're interested. And I think it's just uh, your engagement makes this work. So that's gonna happen right after lunch. We've dedicated an hour to that. That could either go really slow or it could go quick, just depending on your question. So please work on that over lunch. Um, and then after that, we'll have our closing lecture and then we have a reception. So it's all fun things from here on out. Enjoy lunch. <laughs>